we have a fascinating, and I might add, uh -oh. tricky topic <laughs> to discuss now, which is measuring the return on social campaigns. Now, social sometimes feels a little bit like the Wild West. Measuring it certainly is. It's certainly a moving, uh, a moving <coughs> target. I'm joined today by Lynn Powell, CEO of Massimi. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you. And also from Andrew Liebman, uh, interim CEO from Mockcom. So the ladies' team is on deck here. I'm sure you have to work at work, ladies. Well done. Very good. Um, and uh, I'll have to be an honorary lady uh, just for the purposes of this sure. day, okay? Um, and um, please get your questions ready later on because we're going to save time for questions. We can run over a little bit if we need to because uh, this is effectively the last session in this track, okay? So let's have some fun. We're going to dive right in. Should we do so, a small intro? I was going yeah. to ask for oh, an intro. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Would, you, would you like to intro intro yourself and maybe sure. a little bit about Montreal? How about that? Yeah, sounds good. Um, so my name is Anne Lieberman. I've been the interim CEO at Montreal since January of this year. Uh, at first they said, oh, Anne, can you do this for two, three weeks? I know, it's never two, three weeks. Mm -hmm. So they fessed up and like, okay, we need you for three months. And now we're like sliding into September. Um, but prior to that, I was actually running the operations for ModCloth, as well as driving all the conversion rate optimization on store, right? All the personalization, A-B testing, et cetera. And at the height of ModCloth, they've never been profitable. They lost $80 million one year. And so when I joined, they lost $20 million. I stopped the bleeding, made huge changes to the business to $4.9 million. Wow. This year, I'm going to be at maybe around two, and next year is a path to profitability. Wow. In my prior life, I was a fashion designer. Oh, thank you. Uh, in my prior life, I was a fashion designer. I worked in Paris. I worked with John Barbados in New York. I used to oversee 600 million at the Navy. But I knew the future was going to be e-commerce. So I launched one e-commerce startup called Distilled, or DSTLD. It was a denim version of Everlane. And it was all based on search. What people were typing in, how they were typing it in. The moment I had a prototype to photograph for the website, my time for inventory to the warehouse was one to three weeks fast. That was Amazon fast back in 2013. I did tons of testing, what models convert it, what models don't convert. And spoiler alert, no redheads. Editors love redheads, but uh, e-commerce does not. <laughs> wow, interesting. I mean, that's, that's, that's quite an intro, and you're, you're very unusual. Right, because you're going all the way from <laughs> how, how do I how do I make this profitable right. down to personalization and conversion rate optimization? Right. That's that's quite a portfolio you have. Amazing. Right, Lynn, over to you. Okay, so a little different story. I am the co-founder and CEO of Masami, which is uh, clean premium hair care, but we are teeny tiny, so you could take what she said, but minus a few zeros. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we launched in New York Fashion Week in February of 2020. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes a month before COVID kind of locked down in New York City. Um, that's been, that was, you know, obviously I think, you know, that kind of speaks for itself. Um, and then in uh, 2022, um, I launched the Conscious Beauty Collective, which is a group of about 40 indie beauty and wellness brands with the idea of we're all really small, we're super scrappy, but the, you know, helping each other is what it's all about. Um, for us to be able to compete against the big ones, um, we have to think differently, we have to be really scrappy, um, and kind of just really creative. So that is a pop-up store and a co-marketing platform where we do all kinds of crazy stuff and a lot of social obviously is part of that because on my own, my little Instagram is like 25,000, but it's part of the collective, we're like a million. Amazing. So that's how we're, we're trying to figure it out. Great stuff, okay. So my role here, uh, other than being an honorary lady is just as moderator. Uh, but I'm Charles, I am the uh, co-founder of uh, Simplicity DX, a company which works uh, in particular in the area of social commerce, bridges the gap between social and commerce. Right, so um, some of you have very kindly filled in a survey um, going round, there's a little QR code on the, on the seats as well. Um, and we've been asking you throughout the course of uh, this week, really, um, how you measure social, because it's a tricky topic. And one of the questions in there was, uh, which we then averaged. So roughly, how much social revenue do you actually think you can measure? And the average across the brands and retailers that filled it in over the course of this week is actually 43%. 
So we clearly know that there is a measurement problem. So let me, let me go first to you um, and, and say, I mean, have you figured out how to measure it? Do you know what the gap is? I would say the answer is hashtag it's complicated. <laughs> uh, so uh, we recently did a whole influencer campaign. Uh, we did a collaboration with the brand Gunny Sacks from San Francisco, you know, by Jessica McClintock. If you don't know uh, what it looks like, it's like imagine prairie dresses meets Victorian. And uh, they've never been inclusive, right? And the mock cloth is the opposite. We designed for extra small to 4X to 6X. And we want to make sure there's representation for plus size. We want to make sure there's representation for uh, different ethnicities. We even threw in a guy in there. And our Facebook ads, it was really funny. Um, the women were super amused, right? This guy is fully bearded. He looks like Post Malone. And that dude can rock a frock, right? Um, but on Instagram, uh, we had so much hate on there. We lost a thousand followers in a day. And I doubled down. And I'm like, I'm gonna address every single hateful comment. And you're entitled to your opinion, but you don't like it, get, you know, you don't have to look at it. And so, you know, I think it's really important to stay with your brand ethos, but we saw a huge increase in traffic across all our channels. You can't just measure social, right? So social was actually 192% increase. Um, direct was 30, organic was 60, paid social was 100. I was able to scale our Facebook ads by 57% month over month, driving 141% increases in conversion rate uh, out of 15 ROAS. So it was pretty incredible. Uh, and just boosting posts, six cents for all, all the clicks. So a really cheap way of driving traffic. But we can see that 52% of our customers came in from social. So 52% came in from social, that's fascinating because if you look on similar web, which, okay, it's not perfect, but it's a starting point, right? Then you'll see that it's sort of typically about 10%. Similar web for month class, I think is around about 6%. And yet you're saying for this campaign, you were at 52? Yes. It's a big, yeah. it's a big difference. So our competitor actually does better on paid social for traffic, uh, but we're actually higher in direct. So I really think we're at 9.4, there's 7.3. So I really think if they came in from social, then came directly to the store. And that's how I, I am. Um, that's how I behave. Yeah, um, one of the things that, I mean, we, we've done as a vendor, we do a lot of um, consumer research, and, uh, and we ask people, what happens when you see a piece of creative that you know, you're interested in, what do you do? And do you follow the link, which obviously allows us to then actually get directly, or do you go direct to the brand site? Like seventy-two percent goes straight to the brand site. So that kind of mirrors what you're saying, which is, you know, it's where customers are spending time, so they're discovering product, but actually they probably go straight to the brand site, or many, many. Yeah. And I'm sure you probably found it's all UGC, right? It's got to look authentic. Yeah, it's got to look authentic. So um, to your point about direct to the site, so if you looked at our numbers and you just kind of looked at them like without really understanding the nuances or the inferences of those numbers, it looks like we get most of our traffic direct to our site, right? But the reality is that doesn't account for, it's, it's underrepresenting the impact of social because a lot of our social is higher funnel. You know, um, we find that most people need to have between seven and 10 touch points with our brand before they're gonna convert. I mean, I have some people that will come to my site multiple times I, it, it's shampoo and it's not complicated, but yet they come back and they come back and they come back before they actually convert. So, you know, if you just look at the analytics, you know, you might actually think the impact of social is actually not as big as it actually is. And then, of course, we're going to get into it, but like, not all social is equal, mm -hmm. right? And these days you have to be everywhere. Um, but Pinterest does a very different job for us than Facebook than um, Instagram, than YouTube. So you have to also take that all into consideration as well. And people are using the different platforms for different things. Correct. <laughs> I want to pick up on your multiple steps, you know, yes. a sequence of touches over time. Right? This, is, this is something I think that the social platforms really haven't understood. They, they tend to go after the, you know, the shopping ad, instant purchase. But the reality is, is it probably a sequence of touches over time for, for many different types of purchases? We do a lot of contests. So for gunning sex, uh, we have people enter, like name, name it and win it. And so one of the entries was like gunning with the wind. I thought that was hilarious. I'm like, let's go with that one. But the, I got you know, out, outvoted and we did like pockets full of posy. Um, but we do like Instagram lives where we gamify the experience. So we show, we show our new arrivals, right? If it's a purple dress, you've got to vote with the purple crystal emoji. If it's a rainbow dress, you vote with like little rainbow emoji and say if you like it. And every 15 minutes, we're giving away a $100 gift card. So if you voted, then you're instantly uh, you know, added to, to the pool for winning that gift card. It's like $100 here, $100 here. It makes it super fun. 
We do a lot of giveaways as well because it's a great way to build followers and also build our email list. We find you, you got to do one or the other. Doing both, people don't like that. Yeah. But um, I will say that the consumers that you get, not so high quality. So, you know, if, you, if we get somebody who um, will convert through Facebook or through clickbait, that's the, you know, clickbait on Instagram, we've all fallen for that. They tend to not be as good as a consumer for a long-term lifetime value consumer, in my opinion, as a consumer that maybe heard me on a podcast and really understands the bigger story and the brand values and the ethos and some of those deeper things that we're trying to communicate. I mean, we are a conscious beauty brand that is clean, that gives back to the ocean, that has an ingredient from Japan. like. But it's, it's sometimes tough on social to get all that across, right? Because people just want, because everyone now, I think I read the attention span of the average human right now is less than a goldfish. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's eight seconds and a goldfish is nine seconds. So like, just think about that. And it, it, think about ourselves. Right, like right. we're like, I'm like classic, like I'm like, so, you know, you have to, you, you know, if you apply that to your marketing social, it's tough, you know, when you want, you're trying to, 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 you know, woo people and engage people and tell the whole story and they don't have time for that. And to that point, we spent a million dollars last year over a couple of months just to test out Facebook shops, Facebook flash sales, and uh, the customer could not understand it. They were impulse buyers, right? They would buy a pair of earrings for $11 and I'm charging you for shipping $12.95. This is crazy. I don't understand who you are. Right. And um, right. But yeah, they actually were not loyal. They did not come back. So it wasn't worth it. I want to get I want to get back to segments and audiences actually because that's very interesting. But uh, we just did a piece of research on impulse buyers, we call the impulse trap. So there's a report you can go download. And and one of the things that we found is that uh, I'm going from memory because I'm still talking about mm -hmm. this. But 55 percent, I think, or thereabouts uh, of uh, U.S. consumers said so they had made a recent impulse purchase. Oh yeah, and, that's and me two, too. And two thirds of and them, me. Yeah. Two thirds of them regretted it, and only. Only about 25% uh, actually return the products. Yeah. So what that tells you is that you know, two thirds of impulse purchases, people are regretting, they're not returning the product, they're sitting with a product which is a reminder of a bad experience. This is not good for the brand and it's not good for the consumer. So I fell for like the lash lift. I thought it looked so easy. And then I overcurled it, went into like my eyelids. I'm like, oh no. Then I gotta watch all these TikTok videos. How do you relax the eyelashes? You know, so um, that was a regret purchase. Uh, leave it to the professionals, at least with me. Um, but I definitely recommend that high smile, that purple toothpaste, totally works. <laughs> <laughs> but but to your point, I'd rather have somebody make a considered purchase mm -hmm. and take the time, mm -hmm. read the reviews, really think about is this gonna you know be worth it. And then be really happy with it. We have, we have, we're really lucky because our, our brand, we have three times industry average for loyalty. So hair care is not a super loyal category, but we have, you know, once people try our product, they really love it. But I don't have this data, but I would hypothesize the most loyal customers are not the ones who are just buying us on Facebook and Instagram. I'm, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure you're right. Yeah. Something that we did, we invited the um, Gunny Sacks Facebook groups. There's three of them, they're like fanatics and then our uh, top VIPs, and we did like the old school meets technology, so we did a whole virtual trunk show. Uh, so we did the fashion show on there, we showed all the details, what like, inspired the collection, we got to talk to the designer, mm. and yeah, got to ask questions, and we got to have feedback. Cool. Let's, let's go back to segments. Yep. So do you want to talk to the different segments that you reach on social, how you do that, what they look like, how they're different, because I think it's very interesting for other people to understand the kind of people that do it. Yeah, so I kind of think of it as really understanding how to leverage the channel and what it's for, right? So we actually, because we're small and we don't have a huge budget, we have to be really um, careful and crafty about what we do where. And it's not one size fits all. You know, a lot of people think it's just way more efficient to take that same video or the same post and just blow it everywhere, right? But um, it doesn't work as well when you do that. So. Like, I'll use Pinterest as an example. I like Pinterest, okay? Like, Pinterest for us is great. It's shitty for conversion. It's not gonna convert, because people are not there to convert. They're there to discover, explore, learn, educate. But what it's great for is driving um, traffic to our site super cheap. So we can spend money on Pinterest ads 
drive a lot of people to our site, it's a touch point, maybe two. And again, I gotta do 10 touch points before I can get them to convert. So I'm checking the boxes to get people along the journey. And then what I do is I use Facebook to target those people, retarget those people, I should say, because I don't think Facebook works otherwise. I retarget the people. Um, so that's why you get those annoying, you know, when you, you visit a site and then I'm like, the debate cover is following, following me around for, you know, months because I went to one site and looked at it. But, um, but I, so I think this, the way we, we segment is more sort of by behavior. Of course, there's lots of ways to slice and dice, right? Um, demographics, um, you know, price point, hair type. I mean, there's so many things you can do um, and you can go crazy doing it, but I think it's, it's also really keying into right message, right place, right time, and understanding um, what people need to hear when. One of our wins is uh, using high AOV, high lifetime value to create local likes on Facebook. Mm. And I found a ton of success with that. Suddenly I have this full price shopper and she's not converting on sale. And then the old one class shopper, she's really like discount oriented. Uh, she could be a teacher that just wants to wear something fun, but I'm not gonna walk away from her because she still has a high lifetime value. So for 2024, I'm actually gonna design into it to do like my cloth factory, protect that gross margin and keep both customers very happy. Oh, the other thing I'll say is that when we launched, I had a hypothesis about who my customer was. It's totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just because you know, until you really get out there and do stuff. First of all, forty percent of our customers are men. Wow, you think I need it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're our customer. Okay. Men love our products because you can, you don't need to use a lot. You use our shampoo. You don't need the conditioner. It hydrates. Their hair suddenly looks good. They don't have to think about it. And I love getting men because they are an autopilot. They just buy and buy and buy. They are not fickle. They love it. Women, that's a whole different game. But on social, we don't target men because it's a lot harder to find those guys who are willing to take the leap and buy a premium shampoo or conditioner or styling cream. So it's kind of this interesting thing because they find us. Maybe it's through, you know, it's in their bathroom. It's their wife brought it home. I mean, my, my son, we just went on, on vacation and we had one styling cream between my family and he kept stealing it. And I was like, no, like that's what happens. And so anyway, so that's a whole, no, another thing to kind of uh, wrestle with is like getting out of your own way and, and realizing that maybe your own um, theories um, are not completely true. And then following the data and understanding and testing a lot. So right. are you going to do a line for men then? No, why? Our products are unisex. I mean, personally, I love the branding plus. I yeah. think what you're trying to do is phenomenal. Yeah. And therefore, that's an immediate thing. I'll check it out. Because obviously, my hair curls not right. <laughs> not I can say that. It could oh, just okay. be better and cleaner, probably. Don't even tell me what you're using. I'll oh, yeah. just... <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Let's move on. I'm getting embarrassed. <laughs> I mean the formula being cleaner. <laughs> So, so, so let's get to the heart of the issue, right? Because we, we kind of haven't quite got there yet, which is how do you, how do you measure performance, right? It, it's tricky, right? We, we've talked about how many people will go direct to the brand site, and therefore you can't necessarily follow you know, that link all the way through, the attribution is difficult. So, so right. how do you measure it? Yeah. Um, so actually, um, I've been trying out Simplicity DX, right? And for me, it's more uh, a complement to my social strategy. So I've been driving traffic, whether it's paid or organic, and I don't know if you've seen Simplicity DX, they create shoppable landing pages, and they pull in all your videos, they pull in all your social posts. So these people coming in from social, they're staying in the social experience, but you can shop it, you can show all the products that are in the video, all the products that are in the post, and they, they stay in that. And I found that it decreased my bounce rates from 39% to 32%. But more importantly, my customer acquisition cost is $35, and it went down to 17.6. So, which is really good. almost half. So now yeah. I'm at first order, you know, CAC to pay back. Yeah, that's it's really a good. game changer. That's huge. Okay, so if you're a small brand like me and you don't have a budget to have an analytics tool really, then you're measuring across different platforms, which makes it a little harder because you're not measuring necessarily, you know, apples to apples, but you can at least start to understand what's working, what's not working. And we just do a ton of testing. Right, so like we will just put a lot of creative out there and really try to understand what works 
what doesn't work. Because again, you might have hypotheses around things and you might find that um, it's not true. You know, a lot of people will say things like, oh, you know, people really want to know about the founder and the story. Well, it doesn't convert. I'm sorry. Nobody wants to hear, hear me talk about it. It just doesn't convert. They want to see a before and after of great hair. They want to know what it's going to do for them. So it's, you know, maybe I can tell my story in other, you know, channels, right? In podcasts or, but I'm not going to necessarily um, put myself in, in some of those channels where it's just not going to do what I need it to do. The other thing that I find incredibly frustrating, and I would love to know what you think about this, when you start to talk to retailers, we had a meeting with Bloomingdale's. First question they asked, how many social followers do you have? Oh, goodness. If I wanted to buy social followers so that I could go to them and say I have like, oh, I have 500 social followers, I could do that. But like, it's, it's not quality, right? And it's inauthentic to have like just numbers. So, so there's a lot of um, quality over quantity push and pull where it's tempting to try to just build up your numbers um, for those reasons, because you're trying to be a brand that looks like you're growing and, and appeal to those retailers, but it's just gonna bite you in the ass. Yeah, and my opinion. More customers, our returning customer rate is 53%, which is pretty good. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna open this up to the audience in just a minute, so get your questions ready, because there's this is two fantastic ladies who are very, very knowledgeable, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you have a go. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in the study, when we were doing our, our research earlier on, we ask people about what metrics they use and then which one that they would rely on the most, okay? And across the e-tail audience of brands and retailers, I can tell you that a return on ad spend, ROAS, is the number one, followed by revenue, followed by customer acquisition cost, um, followed by conversion rate. So, so it's kind of interesting because ROAS is a little bit of a misleading metric, isn't it? <laughs> do, you, do you trust ROAS or, or, you know, and if so, if so, where do you sit on it? I like to do the opposite of what you just said, start with the conversion rate and work the other way around. Well, that's and testing me. for incrementality too, yeah. which is you know, absolutely pure and clean. And yeah. 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 No, I agree, absolutely. Yeah. Um, the other metric I think which is underrepresented is probably bounce rate. It's a hard metric that you can measure, right? As opposed to you know, like revenue, which is a bit more squishy depending upon who you talk to as to where it's gonna come from. Okay, any, any tips for the audience on on measuring this stuff, you know, what have you learned? What would you do differently? Where are you going to go? Anything? I'll let you start. <laughs> oh, I'm going back to my hashtag. It's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we spend about thirty to forty percent of our budget on social. It's really important for us. It's a very social brand. You may not see it directly, but you'll see it all across your paid channels as well. Tips on measuring. I mean, I I I think. I would say before you even get into the whole measurement conversation, you have to make sure your social and content strategy makes sense. Yes. And that you're putting the right content in the right places to the right people. Otherwise, it's like, what are you actually measuring? You know, shit in, shit out, right? Like, so you have to actually start with a really solid content strategy um, and then again, test like crazy. And then you can start to get into those metrics and, and start to work on improving um, what you what you can. Um, were we going to talk about G4? We don't really have time. We're going to talk about G4, G4? Not, not really. No. <laughs> oh my god, I hate it. Not, not a lot of confidence, in our survey, not a lot of confidence in GA4. Um, any, anybody here having great experience with using GA4 for measuring social revenues? No? Nobody's brave enough to put their hand up. Look, you scratch your head. You, sir? No. Just no. a scratch. Just a scratch. <laughs> okay. Well, All right. Yeah, I, honestly, I trust Shopify data yes. more. Isn't that sad? Yes. I mean, I, don't, I shouldn't say it like that, but it just, is a little, when it comes to measuring revenue and conversion, it just feels more accurate. If there's a variance of 3%, for me, that's fine. But when you're in 10%, we're at 26% off from our revenue. It's just a fairy tale at this point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I've heard that going from. Uh, Google Analytics GA4, people are seeing like a 60% drop in uh, in social revenue uh, just because of the change in the way the attributions uh, happen. Anyone want to share any real stories on, on GA4 over here? No? Okay, so we have a couple of minutes left. Who would like to ask uh, my two illustrious guests here uh, their, their burning question? Who's going to be first? The lady over here. 
Oh, no, okay, sorry. We're gonna go gentlemen first. No, we'll come to you, I promise. Okay, is this thing on? Yes, it is. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Rob Principe from Blue Will Media. I should probably stand up. I'm not going to be disappointed. Um, my question for you is, uh, assuming the followers are qualified, do you have cost per follower parameters for each platform, i.e. 40 to 50 cents for TikTok or four bucks for Instagram? Is that something that you guys measure? No. Uh, I would say yes, we do. Have do you do? Yeah. I is that yeah, whenever we want to scale our spend, we always look at variable contribution margin. For those who don't know that, it's after shipping, after credit card fees. At the end of the day, how much money do you have? Most marketing agencies, they just do a percentage of revenue, right? They want to spend because that's how they make money um, based on your spend. But I want to know what's my break even variable contribution margin because I don't want to be negative. So when someone asks my digital marketing manager, I need 100 grand. Okay, tell me what the VCM is on that and then you can spend it. There's a question here. Hi, my name is Jackie. I work for Hager, it's a men's apparel brand. And I wanted to ask what differentiates your social content from your website content or any other digital marketing content, if there is one. And if you do have a differentiator, is it important or is it coincidental? Uh, when we did the influencer campaign for Gunny Sacks, um, if anyone who knows me, I'm 0% to 200. There's no in between, right? Mm -hmm. So it was a full on influencer takeover on our website, full on influencer takeover on our social, as well as our paid social. And that really had a huge impact. But in general, uh, we, I mean, we had to have fun. Uh, we're a little fun and weird and quirky. So we'll throw in cat memes in there. It's not about sell, sell, sell all the time. So who doesn't like a you know, cute hamster with a little hat on or whatever it is? Uh, we'll do fun gamification on our store. Like uh, who doesn't want to see a dancing dino when you add a product to the cart? And so that's one of my fun things that I, I coded. I think it's really fun. Yeah, I mean, I think some channels just lend themselves better to that. I wouldn't put that on my website, but I would put that on TikTok or I would do, you know, so like I'll give you an example. Like, so I have Masami, but I also have the Conscious Beauty Collective, right? And we have social for both. That's just my brain is, <laughs> but um, as my brand for Masami, we are a premium, Japanese inspired, very zen, gender neutral, inclusive brand. I don't wanna be the one that's stirring the pot, pointing out all the toxic crap that you're using um, all the time. I will do it as a Conscious Beauty Collective because that is a platform where we are trying to make change in the industry. And we have 40 of us doing it. So as a Conscious Beauty Collective, I will post lawsuits, I will post sulfates, parabens, phthalates, I will post all the negative stuff that I won't post as my brand, but it can live there. So it's part of it is just figuring some of that out of what your guardrails are and what you're comfortable with. And you know, are you a brand that has a sense of humor or not? Are you a brand that um, likes dog videos? You know, so you just have to kind of get comfortable with that and then where it can live, where you feel like that makes sense. I know that's sort of a non-answer, sorry. Oh, that was good, thank you. And uh, of course, the, the difference in content that you might have on social, one of the speakers uh, yesterday said that uh, content is the new targeting. I don't know if you heard that. I thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, I, might argue, I might argue that actually uh, landing is the new conversion. But anyway, uh, because because there's limited gains that you can make from other ends of the other ends of the spectrum. But you do end up with almost a recreational content on the edge uh, on social, and that can lead to a visual disconnect. You know, when you then when you then land, and that's that's one of the things that you've kind of got to solve. Because number one reason why people bounce when they click through social is because they can't find the product that they were looking at, or uh, it looks different. So, so yeah. joining that together so, is actually really quite important. What's been popular is uh, showing showing the same dress on different sizes, and people love that. Mm -hmm. And we usually have our employees wearing it. I remember one of our Instagram lives, uh, so they're super opinionated. Um, somebody said, "You're only showing tall people. We need to show it on shorter people." And we're all looking at each other like, the tallest person here is 5'3". Um, but, you know, I, like, maybe I need to participate more because I'm like 4, 10, and 3 quarters. I don't know if you notice, like, my feet don't touch the ground. <laughs> okay, we can do at least one more question, but it can't be about my hair care products, okay? <laughs> so who wants to go next? Yes, what at the front here? Uh, Lynn, you were mentioning um, your testing strategy. And I was just primarily curious if 
um, you have like if you can give any more details around that and if it's different by channel um, and like what you're testing for in that creative and in that content like um, essentially like are there specific variables that you're looking at the copy CTA things like that and yeah, just a little bit more detail yeah I mean it's really trying to understand what um, triggers are the most impactful from a story perspective is it benefits is it certain types of um, customers you're talking tall yeah for me it's you know curly versus straight hair versus this versus that versus dry you know with what keywords what so we'll we'll do a lot of different copy we'll do a lot of different visuals there might be a visual that I think is amazing no one else likes it you know I mean sometimes my I have a 22 year old and a 20 year old and they will sometimes be like ooh that's horrible and you know maybe they're right sometimes I'm too close to it so that's why I think it's just great try a bunch of things um, and and just see see what resonates because like I'm always surprised and that's the beauty of it and it's great on social because you can do it and you can put stuff out there and if it's not great it disappears no one will remember it you know what I mean so okay well can, can I ask you to put your hands together because this has been a great session